This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host. Welcome, everyone. This is the Meaningful Sport Podcast, and I am your host, Nora Ronkainen. Meaningful Sport is a series of discussions on the why and how involvement in sport and physical activity can be an important part of a life worth living. If you are interested in the theme, you might also want to check out MeaningfulSport.com. There you can find podcast show notes, read a blog, and access many resources for further explorations of Meaningful Sport. This is the second part of our discussion with Chris Akabusi on Meaningful Sport. Chris is an Olympian, motivational speaker, and businessman. In his outstanding athletic career, He achieved three Olympic medals, as well as world, European, and Commonwealth titles. In the first part of our discussion, we explored his elite athletic career, and Chris also shared some of his thoughts on the tough world of elite sport. In the second part, we move on to exploring the meaning of sport in his life after the elite athletic career, and start discussing existential philosophy and how it has informed how Chris is thinking about life and sport. If you haven't listened to the first part yet, I encourage you to do so. And either way, I hope you enjoy today's discussion. And so, I mean, you survived, you you certainly <laughs> flourished. You certainly flourished in this very tough world of sport. And we started slightly exploring we talked about this turning point in your life and and how now you are approaching movement or uh, sport exercise and uh, well running in particular in a different way so Mm. please share a little bit about how you have formed a different uh, relationship with movement and how you now find meaning in it yeah so whereas i think elite sport ultimately is abuse of the body on the one hand because you you push it to its limits and you 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 have to really raise the bar now sports is about general well-being it's about connecting to the environment i've got a couple i play i play golf and I jog, yeah. and both of them are pervade outside. Um, both of them can be done by yourself or done with with other people. And even when you're doing it with other people, you're still really doing it by yourself. And there's a joy in movement, and the joy in feeling the mechanics, both the psychological and emotional, as well as the physical. Um, I, you know, so once, for example, when I come in and from the morning for my run, most mornings I don't want to go, but having gone, when I come home, I'm glad that I've been, and it's like a wake up call for my body. It's like it's like me saying that that that, that I'm here, and the day has started, and I mean, I I I, I take two, I mean, I'm I'm very lucky. I take two, two, three hours in the morning getting ready through running, jogging, stretching. Then I've got a little circuit that I do. And it just put, it, it sets me up for the day. So it's much more, I mean, it's probably a bit grand, if I said, but it's much more a holy communion. Mm. D- d- does that make sense? Yeah, I, I was going to ask, this question is a little bit out of the blue, but in uh, you mentioned elsewhere about your Christian uh, worldview and your Christian faith. So I guess my question would be whether you connect sport and, and movement in any shape or form with with your spirituality. Yeah, so my, my Christian faith is not what it used to be, so I, I, I wouldn't want to label myself as a Christian. But I, I do believe that 
when you run, or in fact, when you, when you do any activity, it is an opportunity to get out of the self and connect to the one verse, the, the, the universe, the one, the one energy system that ultimately links us all. I, I, I'm not trying to say that I am the universe or you are the universe or anything like that, but mm. but I sense I sense a connection with 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 the world, you know, whether it's the trees, the leaves, the ground of my feet, the the, the, the wind on my face, you know, there's there's a connection to something outside of the entity that is wrapped up in this body that if you saw, you'd say is Chris. I mm, see that and I feel that. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Yeah, I, I can that. I can relate to some of what you're saying. I'm I'm a runner myself, and and you do have these very intense moments when you feel that you are connected yeah. to the world and and the place. Yeah, yeah. There's there's moments there's moments when you're running, and literally you you just lose time. You just you just lose time. You know, you you've, you've gone past one tree, and then before you know it, you're going over another bridge, and and and, and you are lost in space. You are lost in the ambience. You actually become that space, and then all mm. of a sudden you are interrupted by being back in the world. If that makes sense. Somehow you can step outside of time for mm. for this little moment of running before. Mm -hmm coming back to everyday life mm -hmm. yeah that's exactly. that's beautiful let's then i'm i'm conscious that the time is uh, time is running <laughs> as we talked about running and so let's move on to our shared interest in existentialism can yeah. you uh, share your journey into existentialism then when did you <laughs> become interested in that and, and become a student yeah so you mentioned my christian faith and I had an existential crisis with that in the uh, late 90s and the death of my mother, which is a long story we can't go into now. Um, and so as a human being, you do ask yourself, well, if there's no organised system that you can fall into, what is this? What, 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 what's going on here? Who, who am I? Where did I come from? Um, oh, um, I was married, and I married a German girl, and so German is part of my language, part of the way that I engage with the world, and it's one of those things that one of the things that's in my life that I don't want, didn't want to let go of. So, I love German philosophers, German thinkers. Uh, yeah. Nietzsche is obviously one of them. Hermann Hesse is another one, and, and a guy like Heidegger is another one, and um, yeah. What I liked about Heidegger, for example, I'm not, I won't say I'm a scholar of Heidegger, but Heidegger, his, his idea of thrownness, and that, that resonated with me. It resonates with me that actually I didn't ask to be here, and yet I'm here. I was thrown into this world. I was thrown into a custom, a culture, a language, a time, and a place. Uh, uh, and I have to, and, and I want to wake up. I have to get on with I have to get on with this thing called life and another one of his ideas you know that I liked was the idea that that at some stage when you wake up to where you've been thrown into us of all people when I say us and talk about humankind we become aware we're not here for long <laughs> we, we've got four score years maybe a few bits maybe a less few bits but we're not here for long and so we are always living towards this thing called death and we know it we understand it and so in between those two things i didn't ask to be born and i won't ask to be i won't ask to die i've got to work out i've got to work out who i am and and and, and it's in that context that nietzsche really speaks to me in trying to work out who i am and what i want to become and, and the legacy that i'm going to leave I, I, you know, and uh, so I mean, I, I mean, that that's the real start is is that uh, what I like about existentialism 
It's a very practical way of looking at life without necessarily preconceived ideas. When I say that, you can meet a hundred, again, a hundred extentists and have a hundred different views. You know, it, it's, it, you need to work out your own view of life with fear and trembling. Using the Christian metaphor, work out your, work out your life in fear and trembling. In course, that's um, Simon Kierkegaard said that, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what you're saying about existentialism is actually very practical. It's not about some metaphysical speculations, but it's about what am I going to do with this life that I yes. have. Yes, yes. And just like you said, knowing that we are beings towards death. Yes. Although, although what the existential philosophers would also say that most of the time we live and act as if death doesn't exist. And yeah, so that would be something that is, well, especially now that we live in the middle of the COVID crisis, it's more real that death does exist. Exactly. And, and, and that, but, but, but even in that, even in the COVID crisis, if you looked at the COVID crisis, for example, there are ways for us to deny the death. So, for example, you will have some people who will fastidiously wash their hands, sanitize their hands, wear all the masks, won't go outside their room, trying to avoid and pretend that the death, do, do, do all the rituals, all the rituals they can in order not to face death. Or others will run to the churches, go on their knees, turn their mats around in order not to face death. Or others will just deny, deny that it's there. It, no, it's not there. I don't believe it. It's a hoax in order to deny death. Mankind has this double-edged sword, has this paradox. On the one hand, we know we are going to die, and on the other hand, we do everything possible to pretend it's not happening. We build statues, and we build businesses, and we have we populate the earth with all these children, all in order, well, I mean, it's just a way of looking at it, to deny the reality We are going to die. Yeah, I I was listening to your other podcast and you it's it's certainly you're full of energy, laughing a lot, having this mm. very positive outlook on life and somebody could be easily surprised that mm, existentialism, isn't that this very gloomy type of thinking which is focused on, you know, mm. uh isolation and death. Far from it. Maybe Far from we it, can no. talk a bit about this. Uh, life-affirming yeah. elements of existentialism and how that uh, well, has informed your life, maybe. Yeah. It, no, it, it's because I know I die that, in fact, I make sure I live. I make sure nothing passes me by. I make sure that I engage wholeheartedly in the here and now. I make sure that I don't put off for tomorrow what I can do today. I'm not, you know, so, so, so I actually think in facing life from an existential point of view that the here and now is the, is it, I have a fullness of life that others may deny themselves. I've lost count of the people who said I was going to do this. I mean, I've been to a couple of funerals now. You know, as you get older, as you get to your 60s, a lot of your friends who you've met over the last 20, 30 years, they begin to have ailments. And some people die in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And the amount of time people said, yeah, I was going to do this and now I never will. I've heard it so many times. And so I don't want to be that person that I was going to do this. I want to do this. I, you, know, you know, I've got no hard and fast idea of what comes next i don't know i don't know if there's heavens and heart angels i don't know if there's reincarnation i don't know if it's utter darkness and total oblivion but what i do know is i'm speaking to nora right here right now and i want to engage wholeheartedly i've not put my brain in gear i've not sort of come here with a preset set of answers i've just engaged with nora and engaging with nora and living and breathing and being vital with nora Many other people will listen in and get an essence of us. That's my life. Passionate, engaged, here and now. For tomorrow I die. Mm. I I certainly agree with you that existentialism is not about denying life as as Nietzsche would be 
celebrating life. And and he certainly had a very challenging, difficult life, a lot more difficult than many other people. We know that he always suffered of poor health, for example, for a significant period of his life. But certainly when we when we talk about sport and, and you talked about elite sport, Nietzsche would see uh a lot of value in, in striving and and uh exceeding your limits and, and we discussed in this other podcast with Eunice Tunsell about uh overhuman and whether we might be able to think about overhumans in sport and and, and so that sport could also be an important part of this good life or meaningful life for an existentialist. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I did enjoy listening to that podcast. I didn't agree with everything he says, particularly about Ubermensch. Um, I yeah. think you, I mm-hmm. think you have to be careful when you think when you Nietzsche is Nietzsche. Um, I mean, I, I love Nietzsche. I and mean, one thing he says he despises all systems. He's not systematizer, and so yeah. you know you can come at him at many different ways, and, and often it's your own presuppositions that will actually come out in the end. So when when you talk about the Ubermensch, which is often translated as Superman, or mm. Overman, Overman, Overman is my um, preferred translation, yeah. you have to understand that, that, for example, in Genealogy of the Moles, he's got higher man, he's got a sovereign individual, you, you know, so these are, and, and I'm not quite sure you can wrap them all up and say they're all the Ubermensch. I do believe that the Ubermensch, and as a, I think the Ubermensch is something to come. I believe that man is the rope between ape and Ubermensch, as far as Nietzsche is concerned. I'm not quite sure I agree with him that man was an ape and would come to the Ubermensch, but that's, that's a different matter. That's what he's talking about. And so for me, man is a bridge that must be overcome. An overgoing and a downgoing. That's in, that's how it's true, sir. And so I, I, I don't think that Nietzsche, that Nietzsche was an Ubermensch. I don't think that Goethe was an Ubermensch. I don't think that Napoleon was an Ubermensch. I don't think that Pelé, according to that podcast, is an Ubermensch. No. I don't, but, 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 but I do think you can have these qualities that that pushed the dial forward. I think, and, and of course, now, now, now Nietzsche saw himself as a superior individual. He was an elitist. You know, Wagner, his friend, they were elitists. You know, you can't read Jan G- Morals without saying he's into elitism. But, but the idea for me that the Ubermensch is here today, I don't, I, I didn't agree with that bit. But yes, an athlete can push the dial forward. Sorry, sorry, Nora. Sorry, Nora. I love to hear your. Your commentary and and of course like critiques and and some debates are especially it's it's something we need and and yes. i love to hear your thoughts on that shall we do one more existential theme that yes. would be authenticity okay uh, as heidegger would say not just being doing what the they yeah. are doing is is that part of those ideas that you have been thinking about and has that shape the way you see life as well i mean i have thought about authenticity and whether it's ever possible to be 100 percent authentic um, i'm not even sure if heidegger was talking about 100 percent authenticity um, mm. i do think that, that that we fall we fall back so we we do we, we for example in this in this world that we live in today with COVID, I I am adhering to what I'm told, but it's inauthentic because I don't believe what I'm being told. But the they, Dasman, is telling me the science, which I don't know, Nora, have you read the science? Have you done the research on the science? I've not. And how many of us who look at the television get told the science says this, therefore we do this, have actually done the research. And I think if we were being authentic, or if I was being authentic, let me say about everybody else, if I was being authentic, I would fool myself, do the research, compare and contrast all the different scientists and come up with an educated opinion. But I've just trusted what, what I've just trusted what Dasman says. And Dasman says, Stay in your house, wash your hands, wear a mask, 
and in the UK they say protect the NHS. So, 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 so it is, it is, it is a dichotomy. It is a paradox, isn't it? So this authenticity, but yet, there are plenty of moments in my life when I am authentic. So I think we need to see it as a yin and a yang, as a two and a throw, um, not as as any one of us. Also, not look at myself. I don't think I can be one hundred percent authentic to an inner calling each day and every day. I would agree on that reading of of Heidegger as well that we always fall back to inauthenticity and perhaps there are these glimpses of authenticity. Yeah, I wanted to mm. share in this uh, other podcast um, Professor Gunnar Breivik, who who is a sports philosopher and he's he's doing work on Heidegger. He has written mm. this paper on skydiving and and when you jump out of the plane and then then you are really for a little moment being towards death that mm. death is a possibility when you are jumping to the void and and he would have in his philosophical analysis point out that there's a pos- uh, possible moment of authenticity mm. in in that moment but then we would always fall back to everydayness and we we go on to living our little lives and and doing what everybody else is doing without thinking about it so much so i'm just throwing the idea that maybe in sport there might be some moments that yes maybe disrupt our everydayness oh, well i agree no i mean you 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 know back to uh, the world of athletics i i don't i don't think it will be stretching the analogy too far to say that when you are a world class athlete and you step onto track you step you step towards your death you step towards you step you step on the track towards the death of your psychological construction of who you are when you go to that line you you have to reaffirm who you think you are and and and, and in crossing the line in any other position than first or with a personal best a part of you dies And yeah, so, so, so when the gun goes bang, you're 100% authentic to everything that you have articulated about yourself. You are the athlete, and a part. But this, and this is what I love about it because actually, it's a mini death. I mean, and I think we have all, we, all through our life, we are prepared for the final death, the cessation. Of possibility of any other possibility, we faced it when we when you were a little kid and you are taken away from your mo- mother's breast. You faced it when you were thrown into school. You faced it when you're ripped out to go to work. So, so I do, I, and and in each of these times, you have to be authentic to that person that you are in that in that moment of time. Sorry. Yeah. No, I I love you extend uh, the way you extended that. That the thinking about athletics and and your your experience of of doing that and being there at the moment, I can imagine that and and try to try to see that moment. Mm. Uh, wonderful, Chris. I I've enjoyed. It's been a very stimulating discussion. A lot of ideas, a <laughs> uh, lot of explorations. I will let go uh, let you go in a moment. But if you think of the listeners of this podcast. They are hopefully some uh, somebody who is thinking about meaning and value of sport, exercise, physical activity, perhaps from their personal point of view, or or people who are uh, striving to understand that also from a research perspective. What would be some of the messages and kind of ways to summarize some some thoughts around this theme that you would like the listeners to take with them from today? Okay, so whether you're an academic or a person on the way, I would hope you take away that we are here today and we're gone tomorrow. That this brief moment in time we have is ours and ours to hold and to be all that we possibly can be. That it's a phenomenal experience which I, which I engage with a part of my life only ten years in the athletic arena, that we get this opportunity to touch people's lives and leave the place better than it was when we came. Um, but I do believe, when I say enjoy the journey, what would that mean? When I say enjoy the journey, 
It might even link, even link to your the discussion about authenticity to enjoy the journey to, to engage one hundred percent one hundred percent of it, and then not to not to worry about the incidentals things that in brackets go wrong because ultimately they're also part of the going right of life it's a rhythm of life um i've I've loved the journey i've only got 20 years left i intend to live them 100 percent to the max i think that was a wonderful closing up for for our discussion so thank you so much again chris i i really enjoyed it bless you know Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Research Through Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcast or whichever app you use. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show. It would be a great help for us. We have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes, so be sure to tune in. Thank you all for your support and have a great day.